Thank you for joining me for my presentation today, which is titled Jazzing Up Remote Learning, Play Posit, and Improv Teaching in the Time of COVID. My name is Julia Stevens, and I'm an assistant professor, soon to be an associate professor in the history department here at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. The idea for my presentation today came from a series of discussions I had over the course of the spring term with Karen Harris in the Office of Teaching and Learning with Technology. Karen helped me tremendously this spring as I transitioned to remote learning because of the COVID crisis. And one of the things I found while brainstorming with Karen was that it was really helpful for me to hear how other professors were adapting their courses in order to transition from in-person instruction to remote learning. And in some follow-up conversations with Karen, she suggested that it might be nice if I returned the favor and um, shared my own experience with remote learning this semester. So I'm gonna do that in this presentation, in particular focusing on my experience using the interactive media platform PlayPosit. But more broadly in my discussion of play posit, I'm gonna reflect on how I thought about remote learning this semester, both um, how to meet some of the challenges of remote learning, but also sort of the opportunities it actually presented, sort of silver lining in order to, um, you know, think more creatively about teaching in a time in which we were forced to sort of radically transform the nature of our classrooms. I've come up with a shorthand for some of the ways I was thinking about teaching this semester, which I call improv. And this is in part a play on the actual material uh, in the lecture that I used play posit uh, to uh, deliver to the students, which was on Islam and music and particularly uh, Muslims, Muslim musicians relationship um, to jazz was one of the major themes of the lecture. So I'm sort of bringing those two things together with the title of improv. But uh, more broadly, I think that this idea of improv is a nice way of so, sort of summing up sort of three key ideas that I found were helpful for me this semester in my teaching. First was really embracing experimenting in our teaching. Second is gathering feedback from students. And then third is adapting to that feedback. And I think that's not unlike a sort of extended improv session. First, though, I think it might be helpful to provide a bit of background about my course. So the course is titled Political Islam, Present and Past. It's an introductory level lecture course that meets core requirements both for historical analysis and contemporary challenges. This spring, the course had an enrollment of 110 students. So when we went online in March, I decided that asynchronous instruction was the best fit for the class. I felt that given the size of the class, that it was really impractical to try to do synchronous instruction. And I definitely got feedback from my students that they preferred the asynchronous format for lecture courses. They really complained a lot about Zoom lectures uh, for anything that was sort of more than, uh, larger than size than a small seminar. So in this slide, I give an example of the sort of primary mode of instruction that I developed this spring. So for most of the lectures for the semester, I created an outline for the lecture on a canvas page in which I broke up the lecture into five to 10 uh, sort of mini units. And for most of these units, I then shot um, a sort of short um, voiceover in which I explained a series of my slides. And in general, I found that this approach worked pretty well, but one of the things I found somewhat frustrating is that it was less conducive to engaging students. Um, and that had been a really critical part of my in-person lectures uh, before March, in which I regularly sort of flipped between lecturing and engaging my students in more of a group uh, discussion. And there was some sort of active learning in my shift to remote instruction. In particular, every week students were doing short quizzes. Um, so it wasn't all sort of passive, um, sort of sitting and listening to these lecture videos, um, but there wasn't as much of a back, uh, back and forth. And so so I started to kind of think about, you know, maybe how I could sort of um, change that. 
And then the final lecture for the course really op offered an opportunity to, to do this. So in this lecture, I encourage students to think about contemporary music as a form of political engagement, and in particular, the ways in which Muslim muse musicians have used creative expression as a way to present different visions of Islam and modern society. The lecture covers genres such as jazz, R&B, and Sufi rock, and it therefore incorporates about a dozen different music and uh, video uh, tracks in, into the lecture. And in the past, when delivering this material, I basically have uh, students watch um, or listen to videos or, or soundtracks, and then we talk about the soundtrack. So I don't sort of just tell students how to think about um, this material, but I sort of using the Socratic method, sort of get them to critically engage with it. And I knew that the method that I had used up to this point, um, combining sort of lecture outlines with, with videos, was not going to create the kind of um, dynamic back and forth between the media, my explanations, and student critical engagement that I had really liked as a key component of this um, presenting this material in the past. So. As a result, I would reached out um, to Karen Harris in the Center for Teaching and Learning, who'd already sort of provided me some feedback when I initially transitioned to remote learning. Um, but I wanted her sort of advice about, you know, maybe how to do this lecture differently. Um, and what was really nice is that Karen listened very carefully to what I was trying to teach and really thought about um, what would be the best technology to teach that particular material. So it's one of the things I found kind of incredibly useful about working with uh, TLT was that they didn't just give me sort of canned solutions. They really did think about what I was trying to do in the classroom and then make suggestions with technology uh, based on, on that particular material. So I think the reason that Karen thought that PlayPosit might be a good solution for me for this lecture is that PlayPosit allows you to create playlists that seamlessly combine pre-recorded lectures with media. But I think even more critically, PlayPosit allows the instructor to embed a variety of interactive features that encourage active student engagement. So in this presentation, I'm not going to go into the details of sort of the tech side of PlayPosit and show you exactly how to use PlayPosit from the tech end. There's some really great YouTube videos that um, explain the platform. I found it fairly easy uh, to, to pick up. Um, but instead, what I'm going to do is show how I use some of the PlayPosit features to present the, this particular set of material. So first, uh, one of the features of PlayPosit that I found helpful was it allows an instructor to insert pauses when viewing media, which alerts students to pay attention to certain aspects of the, the presentation or what they're seeing or listening to. So in my lecture, I use these pauses to indicate to students that they should listen or watch for a particular element of a performance prior to seeing or hearing it. Second, PlayPosit has a really nice poll feature. So in this lecture, I use polls to ask students whether they were convinced of certain interpretations of the music or visuals that I presented to them. So rather than just passively saying, well, of course, the professor says that it must be right, I said, well, do you agree? Um, so for example, um, I have the students listen to part of John Coltrane's song, A Love Supreme, and I tell them that some music historians have argued that, in fact, A Love Supreme sounds like A La Supreme, and that this makes some sense in the context of the fact that Coltrane at the time was deeply influenced by Islam. Um, most of my students did sort of, once I had presented that argument, um, sort of pick up on that. Others were not so convinced, which is fine. Um, okay, and then third, probably the most helpful was that PlayPosit has a feature which allows for discussion threads um, to be embedded in uh, the viewing of the media. So while uh, students are watching a piece of media or immediately afterward, they can respond to an open-ended question. And you can see my students doing this in, in the slide in which I ask them to think about the costume choices of the male and female musicians in a video of a Sufi rock group. 
Okay, so I want to return to the metaphor I introduced at the beginning of the presentation, comparing my teaching method to improv and think about how that applies in the case of my experience with PlayPosit. So for me, PlayPosit was definitely an experiment. Normally, I would have been hesitant to try out new technology midway through a course. But I found that this spring I had to be more flexible and also more open to taking risks in my teaching. But at the same time, I really tried to couple that experimentation with two other crucial elements of what I think of as improv teaching. The first was sort of more overtly than I might have done in a typical semester, actively gathering stu student feedback about how the remote learning was going and then adapting my teaching in response. So let's first talk about how I gathered feedback. One of the nice features of PlayPosit is that it actually provides a lot of opportunities for getting feedback on your teaching. So um, as part of PlayPosit, the instructor also has access to a sort of back panel that both shows you how students are answering various questions that are embedded in the bulb. That's what the kind of PlayPosit units are, are called, um, but also, for example, how long they are taking to view the bulb. And I found that interesting. It certainly gave me information that I had not had in the other way that I was presenting my lecture material. I also use the poll feature in PlayPosit um, to actually ask students at the end of interacting with the, the bulb uh, whether they preferred the PlayPosit format or the format of giving lectures that I had been using prior um, to, to this one. So somewhat disappointingly, 64% of students responded that they actually preferred the, the previous format. Um, so I did not immediately take this information to mean, okay, this was a tech failure or a teaching method failure. But that poll did make me step back and realize that I needed to think critically about what were sort of the problems that students were encountering with using PlayPosit and how they might have a, a better experience. So for me, the kind of quantitative poll was sort of a flag, but in the end, qualitative feedback was, was much more important in thinking about solutions. So I actually used two methods of generating qualitative feedback after my sort of play positive experiment. The first was sort of informally during office hours with students, I asked them to tell me more about their experience with play posit. And I was actually surprised that the feedback I got during office hours was sort of less negative than that poll would suggest. I think a lot of students sort of, when I asked them to talk about it, flipped from just saying, oh, I like this or I didn't like it, to thinking, okay, what, how was this pedagogically useful? And thinking that the interactive features were helping them to, to learn more, even if it sort of was a little bit more burdensome. That was the other thing I sort of came, um, had students sort of saying to me during office hours was that it just sort of play posit took them longer, or even if it maybe didn't take them longer, they felt like play posit forced them to sit for an hour and do the whole lecture all at once. Whereas what they had sort of liked about the previous format is they could sort of take a break, come back, um, you know, maybe just do one or two units of the lecture when they had a few spare moments. And that play posit, even though I allowed them to pause um, in the middle of, of the bulb that it just wasn't as intuitive to kind of chunk it out the way that they had been interacting with the previous message. Sorry, previous lectures. And then finally, um, I also um, on my uh, course evaluations put a general question about students' experience with remote learning, but um, many of the responses also sort of commented on the contrast between uh, the different lecture methods. So I'm just going to read a couple of the comments, one more negative, one more positive that I got about PlayPosit off the, the Sears evaluations. Um, so in the first, um, one student says, in terms of the setup, I like how you laid it out prior to the play posit. You gave a page along with its video and a brief description, video examples, and even download to the slides. I learned a great amount with this method. 
So this gave me a little bit more detail of sort of what was lying behind that 64% of, of students who preferred the, the old method. And again, kind of jived with some of the feedback I had gotten during informal office hour discussions with the, the students that um, the sort of chunking of, of the previous method and the ability to sort of navigate um, the different parts of the lecture at their own pace and their own style of learning was something that, that they had liked and that PlayPosit um, didn't, didn't allow them to see how to do that as easily. More on the positive side, um, one student wrote, her last lecture was on a new format called PlayPosit that provided more interactive opportunities. It was engaging and stimulated thinking. So it's this sort of comments that encouraged me to sort of persist with trying to think about how to use PlayPosit, because obviously, you know, what we all want to do as teachers is stimulate uh, thinking. Um, and so um, as I am now beginning to think about my teaching in the fall, um, what I'm trying to do is um, figure out, you know, how can I take those positive things, um, presenting the material in a way that's engaging, that stimulates critical um, analysis and uh, play, but um, sort of minimize the sort of disadvantages that students had pointed out to me. So because I did this at the end of this semester, um, the sort of final stage I have outlined of improv teaching is actually sort of gonna happen um, in the, the fall uh, rather than um, this, this spring. So I am already sort of beginning to plan about the possibility of being back in remote learning, but even if we are in person, I can see myself potentially using PlayPosit as a kind of add-on to an in-person form of instruction. Um, but whether in remote format or in-person format, there are definitely a few things that I will do differently next time I use PlayPosit. So the first is that instead of creating a single play posit bulb for an entire lecture, what I would normally teach in an 80 minute class, I will create shorter bulbs that really are more five to 10 minute um, interactions um, and then put those into an, an outline so students are can really clearly see how they can sort of break down a, a lecture um, into shorter uh, periods of engagement. Um, you know, as I said, I to be honest, I, I would say I was a little surprised about this because, of course, we have 80 minute uh, lecture uh, periods and students basically um, told me and I could see this from the sort of play posit panel that they spent about an hour interacting with this play posit bulb. And so I thought, you know, if you can sit in lecture for 80 minutes, why can't you do a play posit for, for an hour? Um, but I think what I really learned uh, through listening more carefully to the student feedback is that learning remotely and learning in the classroom is, is not the same and that it is harder for students to sustain their, their sort of attention in the remote setting. And they need to be able to sort of walk off, get a glass of water, sort of do elements of the um, course um, in sort of small chunks when they have a few minutes and so um, that is something that I'm going to really try to accommodate um, much more when I use play posit again. Second, I think that in order to sort of address the fact that students sort of found play posit a little bit more work, um, I'm going to pitch it differently. Instead of using play posit to deliver what I would normally deliver as a kind of lecture, I'm really thinking about uh, reframing it to the students as an activity. And so they go in expecting to have to uh, be active in their engagement with the, the material. And as part of this, um, I'm actually going to incorporate it into uh, my grading rubric uh, to give the play posit activity um, to make completing it count for a few points towards students' uh, grades. So I think I was hesitant to do that um, this fall, sorry, this spring, uh, because I feel like, you know, not all elements of learning should all be about kind of getting grades. Um, but I think I'm rethinking this because one of the things I saw this semester is that students really responded well to having the sort of exams and projects broken down into smaller units. When I teach uh, this course normally, 
the biggest part of students grade is two exams and a final project. When I shifted to remote learning, I introduced a bunch of new weekly quizzes in place of the in-person exams and students really liked that. They liked getting that regular feedback. They liked not having the stress of a big exam. And so I think um, this has sort of led me to kind of think differently about um, that, you know, maybe sort of frequent assessment really does um, work well and it helps students to really make a connection between what we're doing in the classroom, whether remote or um, in person, and, and that sort of um, final grade that they do pay a lot of attention to. Um, and then finally, another takeaway for me was to not overload, that making these play posit uh, bulbs is quite a lot of work and that you don't, um, if I tried to revamp my entire fall course with all play posit um, delivery of the material, it would just be an enormous um, amount of, of effort. I wouldn't get any research or writing done this summer. I would just be doing play posit all the time. So instead of, of doing that, I'm really thinking about three or four play posit activities uh, that will be a feature of my fall term course. Um, so great, thank you um, for joining me for this uh, presentation and I look forward to questions with the, the live audience um, now to, to hear about, um, you know, also your own experiences with remote learning uh, this spring.